All right. So joining me on the show today, welcome back, everybody. This is Conversations with Kenny. I'm Kenny. And joining me on the show today is Stephen Hawley Martin. He's a best-selling author of several books, including Afterlife, The Whole Truth, a two-book compilation. He's researched and interviewed dozens of near-death survivors, psychics, researchers into the paranormal, as well as quantum physicists and medical doctors. He's currently the editor and publisher of the Oakley Press and has also won several awards, along with being the only three-time winner of the Writer's Digest Book Award. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Stephen Holly Martin. How are you doing, Stephen? Well, thanks, Ken. Uh, Thanks for having me here. I'm excited about it. I'm I'm so thankful to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Um, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, I want to get into a little bit about um, you and how you got into writing about life after death. Yeah, well, you know, it. Uh, let me preface that by saying I grew up in a family that uh, was pretty scientific and believed in what I call scientific materialism, which is basically what's taught in school, that really nothing exists except for physical substance. If you can't see it under a microscope, it doesn't exist in in that uh, school of thinking. And so that's what I thought. But uh, long about, I guess I was in my mid-20s, I had uh, what you would call an out-of-body experience. Uh, Won't go into detail about how it happened and unless you're really interested, but basically I, uh, I had been very sick and I, uh, the bed started spinning and I suddenly I felt fine and I was looking down at myself from up at the ceiling. I, in fact, at first I saw the ceiling and I said, oh my goodness, and I kind of looked down and there was my body lying in the bed. Well, Obviously, that can't happen if your brain creates consciousness, because here I am up here conscious looking down at my body and my brain's down there inside my skull. So that uh, experience really didn't compute. And so I I went on a quest to figure out how that could be possible. And I really read everything I could about metaphysics. I joined the Rosicrucian Society, which is a society of... uh, a secret society that basically knows a lot of stuff. To to give you an example, one of the members of it was uh, Benjamin Franklin. I believe that Thomas Jefferson was also a Rosicrucian and all those guys back then believed in reincarnation, for example. And, uh, And so, yeah, one thing led after another. I guess a few years later, I read a book by Raymond Moody, who at that, who when he wrote it, I believe was a intern or probably a resident at the University of Virginia Medical School and interviewed over a hundred people who had near death experiences. And I read that, I got so interested in that, I read it from cover to cover in one sitting. So that's basically how I got into it. And I've been studying the situation ever since. You know, all those things that do have to do with uh, with uh, metaphysics and consciousness and life after death and reincarnation, all that. Right. So, so that, uh, that experience you had that really kind of caused you to question the reality that we live in. And, um, you know, what did you find on your, um, on your path? What is the true nature of reality in your opinion? Yeah. Well, I've come to the conclusion that, uh, that, Consciousness is the uh, ground of being. It's what everything comes from, including our physical world, as well as us, you and me, and all life and uh, everything in, in the physical universe, I believe comes from consciousness. And I think that the uh, ancient rishis of uh, India, who really were the founders of Hinduism, that's where it comes from, were right. They believed that what they called Veda, V-E-D-A, was the ground of being. And if you really get into what they're talking about, Veda is consciousness. And there are quantum physicists that I've talked to who also think that's true, that the, that the ancient rishis of India were right on, that they knew what they were talking about. Only they call it the unified field, that everything comes from the unified field, that all that the different forces that we have of gravity and electromagnetism, all that, 
come from the unified field, which if they're right, uh, would make sense. And, and in fact is consciousness. And really it's something we all share. I think there's really only one life, one consciousness that we are all part of. We think we're different, uh, but uh, really at the core, at the very core, if you, what I call the silent observer of your mind that can look out and, and even observe your own thoughts is a consciousness, is consciousness and the universal consciousness that we all share. I, I, I see. So modern science doesn't really recognize consciousness as a real thing. It kind of uh, discredits consciousness. Is that, am I correct in, in saying that? Yeah, yeah they would, you know, they, <laughs> uh, it's not, I really don't understand their point of view, but yes, they, uh, they don't, I guess, believe that consciousness exists. For one thing, no one, no scientist today or in any time in the past has ever figured out how the brain creates consciousness. It's what they call the hard problem. And in fact, I've written a book called The Hard Problem Solved, where I, I go into uh, this theory that we've just been discussing about how quantum mechanics demonstrates that, that uh, consciousness is everywhere at once, that, that, that it's something we share. And I use the double slit experiment where uh, a uh, where a scientist or researcher that's conducting the experiment, what he knows or doesn't know or can know, changes the outcome of the experiment. Now, how could that happen if consciousness is contained within your skull? So anyway, they will they just think it's some kind of a you know phenomenon that we're really not conscious that we don't even have free will. Uh, I, you're going to have to get a scientist who believes that to explain why and how they think it works because it makes no sense whatsoever to me. I couldn't agree more, you know, because I, I definitely believe in consciousness. I believe everything has vibration, you know, and everything is a living thing really. Um, with that being said, I also am a believer of reincarnation and from listening to you, um, you know, I think it's safe to say that you feel somewhat the same way. Uh, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about reincarnation and that process um, and, you know, what you kind of think it all means and, and where it's kind of leading to. Yeah, I, uh, the, I do believe in reincarnation. I believe that I've had past lives and I, I'm pretty aware of several of them now after I uh, have really researched this and had, had some psychics uh, do some <laughs> investigating about my own uh, past lives and so forth. And the thing of it is, uh, the proof that, well, I won't say it's proof, but the evidence for reincarnation is pretty, pretty strong. Uh, the University of Virginia School of Medicine has been studying this for 60 years, since 1960, I believe, 60, 61 guy named Ian Stevenson, who was a pr professor of, uh, he was a psych psychiatrist, but he was a professor at the University of Virginia Medical School, uh, began researching uh, children's memories of past lives. And they're still doing it today. Uh, Ian Stevenson died in 2007, but a gentleman that I, I've interviewed a couple of times, Jim Tucker, who's also a psychiatrist, child psychiatrist, uh, had took over for him. He's written, he's, and Steve, uh, Jim Tucker's written a couple of books about it. And Ian Stevenson has written more than a couple, a whole bunch of books about it. They have collected over now, I believe, 2,700 cases of children remembering past lives. And they've been able to check out the uh, person that the child th th thinks he was and I think something like 1,600 of them, and they verified that the, what the child remembered and this entity that lived or person that lived and died in the past, uh, check out. So, and there's some just amazing uh, stories uh, about that, you know, about people who do remember their past lives and are able to come up with all kinds of information about it. Uh, it it's... Uh, it's really, once you get into it, very hard to refute. 
Absolutely. You know, I've seen the articles, uh, you know, where kids come back and they actually uh, identify, you know, uh, criminals and, and killers and things like that. And that is just absolutely fascinating to me that they're able to recall those things at such a young age. You yeah, know. one of the things, and let me tell you about one story, because that just reminded me, one of the things that uh, Ian Stevenson noted was that in many of, of these children's uh, remember past lives have physical scars. Most of them, and perhaps one of the reasons they remember their past life is that they had an untimely, unnatural death. Either they were murdered or they were killed in a war or they were killed in an accident or something like that. And so their life was cut short. And so they probably come back a lot sooner than we do normally when we have a normal lifespan and, and spend time between lives and so on. And one of the things that he found, and he published a whole book on this, was birthmarks that uh, are uh, reflect the wound that killed the person. One example would be this this guy who was a school teacher in India, I believe, who was shot in the forehead when he was riding his bike on the way to work, the way to school, and the child that came back who remembered this past life and remembered being murdered had a uh, birthmark on his forehead that was round and on the back of his head it was a great big like splat where the exit wound would have come out wow and there are all <laughs> there are dozens of examples like that in ian stevenson's book about uh, i think it's called uh, where reincarnation and biology intersect. Uh, you could go on Amazon and probably find it. That is absolutely fascinating. Do you think all birthmarks like are from even not necessarily uh, that just ended life ones, but like just even small ones? Do you think those are from past lives possibly? I think it, it, it's possible. I don't know if all of them are. I have a friend who uh, remembers several of his past lives uh, pretty vividly. And in one of them, he uh, committed suicide, which uh, is a whole story unto itself, how he uh, happened to find out about that. But he had a uh, birthmark on his temple and the same kind of exit wound. So, uh, you know, yeah. I don't know if they're all like that, but I think it certainly happens. There's one, there's one case uh, where a uh, child was had his hand caught in a, uh, a chopper that chops up uh, right. wood or something like that. And he was born with, with a mangled uh, hand, the one that was uh, disfigured that way. Right. Another child had a, uh, was shot in the ear by a hunter who thought he was a rabbit or something was lying in the grass. And uh, he had an ear that was mangled when he was born. So, I mean, it's, you know, all kinds of things like that that are just no way to explain them except through reincarnation. With all the evidence for reincarnation, um, what, what is your opinion on, what is its purpose? What is the purpose of reincarnation? Um, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah. You know, I think that... Uh, it goes to the purpose of, of life, which is, in my opinion, is evolution. Um, I've got a novel called The Secret of Life, and, and I, spoiler alert, The Secret of Life that the heroine discovers when she's uh, going through this very interesting uh, adventure that she has is that the secret of life is the urge to become. I think that life has the urge to become, that it's born in us, that it permeates everything when you see plants growing toward the sun, you know, and doing whatever they can to reach it when you, uh, just life wants to become. And I think that's something that's in us. And we, I believe that reincarnation comes about as a result of us wanting to grow and become better and to evolve. And, uh, an example I give is the movie uh, Groundhog's Day. If you have you seen that, uh, Ken? I have, yes. Yeah. Well, then you you know that uh, Bill Murray's character 
starts out in that movie as a real jerk. You know, he's so right. cynic. Right. And people come along and he just treats them that way. And he's, <laughs> you know, it makes a mess of everything. The right. girl that, the, the, you know, uh, Alec, what's her name? Uh, uh, anyway, she, <laughs> that he would like to become friends with, you know, realizes he's a jerk. Well, as the movie progresses and each time he wakes up, instead of it being February the 3rd, it's February the 2nd again, Groundhog's Day, the same music playing on the radio. And he goes out and he meets the same experiences again and again and again. And finally, after 90 minutes or so, he's changed how he deals with them. And he deals with them in a way that's you know, loving and considerate and does what you would think is the right thing to do each time. And, and when he finally makes it through a day like that, he, uh, he not only is able to move on to February 3rd, but he gets the girl. So I think that is an allegory of what life is about, that we, uh, we come back because we have things to learn. We have sometimes missions to accomplish, uh, you know, it, uh, it may be a combination of things, but I think the main thing is to evolve. And I believe that, that lo- that's what life as a human is all about, evolving. And that there are other levels of consciousness that we're gonna reach. Uh, and in fact, uh, some think that we're evolving now that we're changing from what's called a third density reality to a fourth density reality. Third density being we're aware of ourselves and we're able to think about ourselves and step outside ourselves and consider things like we're talking about right now. But fourth density is when we realize that all is one, that we're, we're part of one life and that whatever we do to others, we're really doing to ourselves. I absolutely love that. I, 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 I love that the way you put that. <laughs> um, do you think that ties in with the age of Aquarius? I do. I do. I think that uh, that the idea that we're, well, some say that we started, we moved from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius that it started in 19, about 1987, I guess. And, you know, it's something these ages take a couple of thousand years. Sure, for sure. Uh, the, la- the last one being the age of Pisces, which you could say was Jesus, you know, the fish. Right. But uh, we're moving into the age of Aquarius and that and third density and the moving into fourth density seem to be coinciding. So, I mean, that whole idea about third density and fourth density comes from raw and the law of one, which was an entity that was channeled back in the early 80s. There's something like five books that, uh, that lay out all of the transcripts of, of every, every one of the uh, channel sessions they had over a period of a couple of years. And he's the one that said there are seven densities that you know, the first density is is mineral matter, you know, a, a planet with no life on it. The second density is one with life, plants and animals, and the third density is one with life, but also sentient beings who have self awareness. And then the fourth density being when we realize we're all one. The fifth density is where we really develop our technology, and the sixth density is when we put it all together. And the seventh density is when we begin returning to the source. And, and and I guess it starts all over again at that point. But so the idea that, uh, that Ra put forth uh, almost 40 years ago and the idea of moving into the age of Aquarius seemed to parallel, seemed, seemed to go right together. They really do, they really do. I kind of want to go back to karma a little bit and reincarnation. And, you know, it seems that uh, reincarnation has been, I don't want to say covered up, but it's not really taught in Western civilizations. It's kind of shunned. It's kind of, you know, scoffed at, um, you know, by science and traditional, um, you know, the traditional church. And why do you think that is? Why, you know, why is it suppressed? Why is it just, you know, the, we live one life? And you either get it right or you don't. And if you don't, then you know that that's the end. Yeah, well, not only the end, but you go to hell and burn for eternity, which is right. pretty, pretty rough treatment for getting a few things wrong. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. well, you know, it's pretty obvious to me the reason for all that. And it's, uh, it's pretty simple, really. Um, 
reincarnation is something that more people on earth believe in today than than don't we just happen to live in a society that is based on uh you know christian teachings and in christianity christians jesus believed in reincarnation and you there i can quote a couple of passages and I'll, i will do quickly you know he he told his disciples that elijah that uh, john the baptist was Elijah. Well, how could he be Elijah? He was, Elijah lived 400 years before John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was Elijah reincarnated. Uh, his Jesus, uh, uh, he asked, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people think I am or who they say I am? And they said, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people think you're uh, one of the prophets. But of course, we know you're the son of God or whatever. But anyway, if people thought he was one of the prophets, they must have thought he was one of the prophets reincarnated because the last prophet died four or 500 years before Jesus came along. So it was something that was part of the, the church in the early years. But I believe it was 553, the, the uh, Council of Constantine. There was a emperor at that time, I think his name was Justinian, who was the head of the church. I mean, the Pope uh, reported to him. And Justinian didn't want there to be reincarnation as part of the part of the church, because, you know, think about it. If you want to control people, then, you know, if you don't do what we say, and, and you know, Absolutely. Donate to the church and, you know, do <laughs> pay homage to the Pope and all that stuff. You're going to hell. Well, that's a pretty strong uh, motivation to, to get in line and behave. So in that council of Constantine in 553, they banned the idea or the doctrine of Christianity and it's stuck. Even, and you know, that was, the church had been around for 500 years and they got rid of it. And today, you know, talk to a, the Pope or whomever and and they don't, maybe they don't know that or if they do, they don't care. They, they're, that's their story and they're sticking to it. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I totally, I, I totally believe that. And, uh, you know, I can kind of see that myself and my, my personal thoughts on, on why it has been kind of hidden from people is because, you know, I feel like there's a group behind the scenes and I don't know 100, 100% who that group is, but I feel like there's a group behind the scenes that has, for whatever reason, it seems like they've been given control over this realm and that they kind of keep us trapped in this realm by using tactics like fear and, uh, you know, and it just seems like they don't want us to know that we live multiple lifetimes because they don't want us to spiritually evolve. Um, and that's why I asked you that question. I just want to kind of get into that a little bit, you know. You know, you might be right. I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, the church really, well, you know, if, if, you, if people think you're going to have more than one chance, I don't know. I've never been in a church when they're the preached uh, hellfire and damnation and come down the aisle, you know, and, and all that, but it's, got, they're using fear big time yeah, to keep I, I people, agree. you know, in the church and uh, keep those donations flowing. I mean, I don't think that all pastors nowadays, uh, nor do I, use nor that. Do. you know, there are plenty of them that uh, I, I've spoken many times on, uh, to a church in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, that is uh, a unity church and they believe in reincarnation and they, but they quote scripture and all too and they've had me down there talking about these things that we're talking about tonight so you know not all churches are like that but certainly the the uh, traditional ones the, the ones that have uh, a a set canon or doctrine you know right. you have to go go to classes and learn it and swear that you believe it in order to join yeah they're still hanging around with that but i think they could probably do themselves a lot of good by getting them getting up to date and accepting <laughs> the reality that really that really is out there you know it's for sure absolutely absolutely um you know one of the questions i have for you uh what what do you believe 
is the ultimate destiny of humankind? I think the ultimate destiny is to, you know, I'm not sure. I wouldn't say that I know, but I think that we eventually combine into a a sort of super um, entity that is that we keep our individual identities in terms of our consciousness but we become part of something much bigger which may become a new universe you know and that's i think when it starts all over again so that it's just we keep evolving forever eternity means no beginning and no end so you know we're going to be around for a long long time and i think the next level the fourth level if that's what it is is going to be a whole lot better than this one it gets better and better as we go up the scale i couldn't agree more i i and i hope it does you know i'm i'm looking forward to changing densities you know uh, <laughs> vibration levels increasing a little bit you know um, one of the things that ross says is that the fourth the third density which is you know where we are we're moving into the fourth but the third density he says or it says because it's Ra is a sixth density being that's a whole civilization. He says that uh, it's a hundred times more difficult than any other density, period. But it's also the shortest one. So probably, you know, less than how long have we been around on this planet? Uh, Not even a million years. Well, maybe early hominoids, but uh, not much more than a million years. Whereas the fourth density is supposed to last something like 30 million years. Really? I did not know Mm -hmm. that. I've heard of the law of one. I've heard of, you know, raw, the law of one books um, through actually David Wilcock. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him or not, but uh, you know, they talk about um, some higher beings and, you know, that's where we kind of get into aliens a little bit, uh, you know, and what do you think UFOs are? Um, you know, I want to kind of jump over to that a little bit, uh, other life. Well, yeah, if Ra really was uh, who he says he was, and then I think he probably was, he was a civilization that existed on Venus. Uh, NASA has come out recently in the last year or so saying that, yes, life uh, could have evolved on Venus up until about two billion years ago, it was uh, hospitable to life, had a lot of liquid water and so forth and the right temperatures and the right atmosphere. But uh, I think that UFOs and are from alien civilizations that are far ahead of us and that they haven't landed on the uh, lawn of the White House and asked to go see Joe Biden yet because they don't want to interfere with our free will, that they see that we're evolving and that when the time is right and we're ready, then they will communicate with us. I think they've already communicated with a lot of people and like Ra is one instance of that. And according to Ra, he came to earth and actually incarnated in the Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian uh, period and, and taught them how to do the, how to build the pyramids and all that sort of thing. So, I totally uh, and I think with there have been ancient aliens, you know, the Absolutely. whole thing about ancient aliens is true, you know, Absolutely. it has, has you, happened in the past. When you look into the pyramids and you look into like how crazy, you know, like accurate they are and like their position um, with the stars. Uh, and I think it's also, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it like there's a mathematical equation for the height of the pyramid, which is exactly the circumference of the planet. And it's just... Oh, yeah. It's, it's absolutely bizarre. Have you heard of the whole Dayton? thing is amazing. And just think of the size, some of those stones that are way up there in the thing, you know, are 70 tons. We don't have something that could do that today. We don't. Could have. <laughs> it's truly fascinating. It really, it truly is. Have you heard of uh, the species, the blue avians? I have not. I have not. I've heard about uh, indigo, indigo children, but not blue aliens. Tell okay. Me. And I've heard of the grays. I've heard of the tell grays me. too, yeah. The blue avians, I, I believe they're a seventh density, or maybe they're a sixth density as well. I don't know. Corey Good talks about them, um, and him and David Wilcock, and they're the ones I heard the raw law of one from. 
and uh, you know they have Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics with the blue avians as well. They're the blue-headed bird. They're like a bird humanoid, extraterrestrial, um, that was supposedly around Egyptian times and helped the Egyptians out building pyramids or whatever they were doing. You know, but well, that might have been Ra because the in the god Ra in the uh, Egyptian culture, ancient culture does have a bird-like head and it's very tall and slim and has a kind of a sun kind of thing on his on his head that he wears and uh, so and Ra was supposed to be seventh and a sixth density so it okay. may, it may be that there's maybe I'm getting some, them confused then but I was just curious if you'd heard of the blue avians or not <clears throat> no, no I haven't so um, one, one of the, another question I have for you is I want to get back to past life regressions a little bit mm -hmm. and that kind of, kind of that process, um, you know, because I've personally been kind of curious about getting a past life regression done. Is that something I can do by myself through meditation or is it something that requires, you know, somebody with uh, some psychic abilities? You know, there's, uh, there are some, uh, on YouTube, some meditations that are supposedly will help you go into a past life, remember a past life. I think one of them is done by, is it Alan Weiss, who is a psychiatrist who regresses people. Uh, and I have tried that. I have not, been, that's not worked for me, but it, it possibly could for you. It's worth a try. Alan Weiss, Past Life Regression. I think you put that into YouTube. You, it would come up. It's W-E-I-S-S. -E -S. And he's got an interesting story. You know, he's, he was uh, a regular psychiatrist who, didn't, who was a materialist. And he had a patient, a young woman named Catherine, who uh, had some phobias or whatever, and he was trying to help her get rid of them. And, and he, was, he was regressing her to her childhood, he thought. He, want, he told her, to, he had her hypnotized, and he told her to go back to the time when the problem first began. And she went back to a life that occurred 3,500 years ago, which of course blew his mind. Wow. But he uh, accepted that and worked with her and went through a number of lives where she had been reincarnating with the same guy that it was, I think, her husband or her boyfriend in this life. And they'd been trying to work this karma out for the last 3,500 years and hadn't been successful. But finally, through his help and her remembering these past lives, she was able to get, get over it and, uh, and solved her problems. Her, her, her phobia went away. So uh, he is now, that's what he does. He does past life regressions. And he's, you can find him on YouTube. That's fascinating. I'm gonna have to check that out because I'm I'm super curious to uh, kind of dive into what some of my past lives may have been and uh, kind of find out you know what karmic cycles I'm meant to break to kind of grow and yeah. evolve a little bit you know because I think that's that's the name of the game you know uh, so that's absolutely correct yeah. Um, I, I think I got through all my questions I had written down. Uh, you know, you covered a few of them there all in one foul swoop. <laughs> you know, uh, is there anything you want to add? I'd really like to ask, uh, kind of let you do a plug on your books and oh, yeah. where people can find you at. Yeah, well, let me do that. Um, I have a website. It's a, easy to remember. It's shmartin.com, Stephen Hawley Martin. So Martin. Dot com. You can go there and up at the top, there's a menu and click on books and you'll see most of my books. And if one of them interests you, you can click on it. It'll take you to a page on Amazon where you can learn more about it or maybe read the first chapter or two. I've got a book on uh, afterlife, which we talked about earlier, afterlife, the whole truth. And uh, there's one on the raw, the law of one called uh, your... Uh, your guide to achieve fourth density. And then there's another one on enlightenment. So go to that, take a look and uh, see if you might find something that'll uh, be of interest. Awesome. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And actually one more quick question. Can we uh, talk a little bit about 
the law of attraction and how to, uh, you know, use it to your benefit? Well, one of the, I probably the basic law of metaphysics is that like attracts like. Um, that's, and so let me give you an example of how that works when you'd rather not have it work. Say, you know, somebody who always seems to attract a partner of the opposite sex who treats them badly, who abuses them. Well, why does that happen? It happens because like attracts like. The person who attracts somebody who abuses them must have a very low opinion of himself and attracts someone to them who has the same low opinion. So that is the law of attraction, like attracts like. So if you want to attract a better life, you're not going to do, you're not going to get a, attract a Mercedes by visualizing it. It's not going to appear in your driveway. I wish it worked that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it works. How it works is, is becoming whatever it is that you want. You know, I believe, and Ross said that Jesus was a fourth density being who came here to tell us, uh, you know, to tell us how to move from third density to fourth. Of course, his message is completely bastardized by the church, but the idea of uh, loving your neighbor and all that. And one of the things that he said is, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So notice the tense change. You have to believe that you already have whatever it is that you want to attract. And you do that by becoming uh, a wonderful receptacle for that. Like attracts like. So that's the basics of the law of attraction. That's great. That's great. So thank you so much for your thoughts on that. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time, you know, I know you said your wife has dinner cooking for you and everything. So uh, I just want to, I just want to say one more time, uh, you know, I, I'm super grateful and thankful for you coming on the show tonight. Well, I appreciate it, Ken. And uh, all you listeners out there, go to my website, shmartin.com. Thank you so much. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. I'd definitely love to have you back on the show and, uh, you know, get into some, a few other topics. So um, that concludes the episode with Stephen Martin. Thank you so much.